Hello everyone, we're very happy to have you again. In this program, of course, we meet lots of the specialists in different fields to cover the most important issues. And of course, before we had Dr. Michael Behe, and today we have a very special guest. He's Dr. Gutner Bishley. And before we start just talking to him directly, we would like to introduce him. Um, we would like to say that he is a German scientist, he's a paleontologist, specialized in the fossil history and systematics of insects, especially dragonflies. He, he was a skeptical of new Darwinian theory of macroevolution for purely scientific reasons. Uh, he was a staunch atheist and materialist until the early 40s, but after a spiritual journey, he took several years to finally embrace a worldview of philosophical theism. So welcome, Dr. Gutner. we're very happy to have you. Glad to be here, thank you. It's our pleasure. So in the beginning, of course, I would like to say to our viewers that um, it's something new to talk about paleontology. It's not an easy task to do, and it's, it's really an honor to talk about this. Uh, so in the beginning, we would like to know before getting to uh, the, the, the talk and the presentation about uh, the fossil record and how to respond to evolutionary uh, arguments. Uh, so what is paleontology in general for, for the viewer to understand? Right, so paleontology is the science that deals with the ancient life, with life of the past, of past ages. And uh, it starts, let's say, about 10,000 years ago with frozen mammoths uh, from the Ice Age, and then goes back over millions of years till, till the first fossils in the Precambrian, which are something like more than 3 billion years old. And it is distinct, distinguished from archaeology. Archaeology is the field where you look for the human history and prehistory. And paleontology is even looking for older ages and for ancient plants and animals and how they lived, what existed, uh, what was their distribution, what did change, what uh, were differences in past uh, ec ecosystems. So that is the science of paleontology. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So we'd like to cut to the chase and get to the amazing uh, slides of the presentation. We are really interested to see what's in it. So please have your time. Great. So thank you. So I start my presentation. I have to look for screen sharing. So we go there. So my talk is about scientific arguments against neo-Darwinism and for intelligent design. And the emphasis, as you already indicated, is on scientific arguments. So I'm not talking about religion or even holy scriptures, uh, but just about scientific problems that question the feasibility of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. That would be the mechanism of pure random copy errors, uh, random mutations, and natural selection. That this is sufficient to explain the diversity and complexity of life. And on the other hand, also positive arguments for intelligent design, so that an intelligent cause was needed to, as best explanation for the available scientific evidence. So a little bit about uh, myself. I was for 16 years a curator at the Natural History Museum in Stuttgart at the Department for Amber and Fossil Insects and encountered arguments uh, against Darwinism when I organized the large exhibition for the Darwin year in 2010 and then gradually started to question Darwinism myself and became a Darwin skeptic and a Darwin critic. So if we look at the actual arguments, uh, the first arguments usually Darwinists will say, well, the origin of life, that is a problem we haven't solved yet, but it's not part of the theory of evolution. That's before and evolution, the theory, Darwinian theory starts when we have life. But that is exactly the problem because to have Darwinian evolution, you need at least a so-called replicator. You need a system that can self-replicate, then that has this uh, system of a kind of genetic code that can be inherited, that can be translated into proteins and so on. And uh, this is required for the Darwinian process to even get started. But the Darwinian process is believed to be the only possible naturalistic explanation how to overcome very improbable uh, uh, events that create complex structures. So if the first replicator was already complex, you cannot explain it by Darwinism because uh, 
it is required for Darwinism to, to start. So you have a kind of a chicken and egg problem. And this problem has proven to be so hard to solve that there are now even biologists like Eugene Kunen, who is a famous uh, evolutionary biologist, who, like many cosmologists, now invoke uh, a multiverse, an infinite ensemble of parallel universes, to explain this improbable origin of life in a naturalistic way to, to avoid the God hypothesis. And that shows, in a way, the desperation uh, of the naturalistic approach that you have to appeal even to an infinite multiverse in biology to, to save naturalism. And this uh, argument was very well elaborated by an American uh, intelligent design proponent, by Stephen Meyer, in a book called Signature in the Cell, which I can very much recommend if you're interested in the details of this argument. So another argument that uh, questions the feasibility of the Darwinian process is the origin of new protein folds. So proteins are the building blocks of life. Everything is made of proteins in the living realm. And proteins themselves, they are made of amino acids. And amino acids, it's about 20. It's like letters in an alphabet. And how you combine these letters, you get words. And these words are or sentences, and these sentences are proteins. And now these sentences can be meaningless, meaningless combination of, of letters. Then it would be a protein that has not a biological use. It's, it's not folding. It has no function. All the uh, sentence of amino acid letters can be meaningful. That means the protein folds in a certain three-dimensional structure and is then useful for biological purposes. So the question for the Darwinian process is, since the Darwinian process is a stepwise process where you say you always have only very small changes and every change <coughs> has to be advantageous, uh, to be selected by natural selection, or at least not too negative, that it can be uh, uh, promoted by, by so-called genetic drift. But, uh, you need the possibility to bridge the gap between one protein and another protein or between no protein and a functional protein by small steps that are all working. If it should turn out that you need 100 correct changes of the amino acid to get the next working protein, then a Darwinian process cannot jump from one protein to the other because you have a too big gap between them that cannot be bridged by an, a stepwise process. And uh, a colleague of mine in America, Dr. Douglas X, he has tested this in the lab and he found that if you look at all the possible amino acid combinations in this combinatorial space of these amino acid letters, then only one compared to 10 to the 77th power of all possible combinations, only one of them is working, is folding in a three-dimensional structure. This number, 10 to the 77th power, is more than there are photons or elementary particles in the visible universe. So this is an unbelievable large number, and this minor uh, amount of one compared to this large number is really working. And this means that this combinatorial space of all possible combination, these islands of functions, they are so isolated, they are so far apart from each other that they cannot be bridged by a stepwise process where every step is working and can be selected by natural selection. So protein evolution, in a way, is mathematically impossible. And that is, of course, a major problem since proteins are the building blocks of life. So this is a very powerful argument, I think, against neo-Darwinism. Another famous argument that has been uh, at the very start of the so-called intelligent design movement has been the argument of irreducible complexity that was mainly championed by, by the uh, American biologist Michael Behe. And a famous example is this bacterial flagellum, the outboard motor of, of the bacterial cell. 
And uh, sometimes biologists think that this is an idiosyncratic argument by, by Darwin critics, but that's not true. Actually, uh, this is an argument that was formulated by Charles Darwin himself in his uh, book on the origin of species in 1859. And there Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. That means Darwin himself has shown a possibility to falsify his hypothesis. And what intelligent design proponents do is to use this argument to look for such complex organs that can be demonstrated to not have been possible to have originated by a stepwise process of successive slight modifications and such structures are called irreducibly complex. And this is still an argument that is used uh, 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 that this, these small steps are necessary by modern Darwinists. For example, Richard Dawkins has written a book, a Mountain Improbable, Climbing Mountain Improbable. And he has said, well, imagine uh, the obstacle for the Darwinian process to, to overcome is like you're standing in front of a cliff of a mountain and you want to jump on the top of the mountain. It's impossible, it's too high, and this cliff is steep and vertical. But on the back side of the mountain, there is a slender slope with small steps. You can climb the mountain from the back side. And that, the claim by Darwinists is that every structure in the biological realm is of this type. It looks complex if you look from one side, but if you look from the other side, it can be achieved by these small steps uh, with small modifications. Well, what uh, Michael Behe showed is that there are a lot of structures where this is impossible because they are built by a lot of substructures that work uh, together. And if you remove only one structure, then the whole complex breaks down. So you cannot build just one and add another substructure and add another substructure because all these intermediate parts are not working. And uh, famous examples are for uh, uh, mainly the molecular machines and the cells. So now we know that the cell is a kind of fabric. It's not a blob, a blob of protoplasm as Darwin thought, but it's an incredibly complex structure with uh, tiny machines and this famous machine, the bacterial flagellum, is uh, one of the few examples in the biological realm where you have a rotating structure and it looks like an electromotor and it is an electromotor. It's rotating, it has a propeller and a shaft and a bushing and all those parts that an electromotor has. It's built by 40 different proteins and if you remove one of these proteins or several, then the whole apparatus breaks down. It can work with 100,000 uh, rotations per, per minute and it can reverse the direction in a quarter turn. So it's a wonderful machine. I have here a video where you can see it working. This filament is the mode, uh, is uh, it's driving the flagellum and the medium. And here you see this rotating motor, which looks like a machine. Another example is the apparatus that is used in the cell to duplicate uh, DNA. And it's a kind of copy machine because the DNA is double-stranded. You have to copy both strands of the DNA. One can be copied simply and the other has to be spliced together with small parts. And you can see this apparatus working here. The middle part is like this kind of stamping machine, which is cutting off small parts of the DNA counter strand and splicing them together. And again, this looks like a very complex designed machine. And if you remove any tiny subparts of this protein, then it stops working and to have any kind of useful function. The last example of these molecular machines is the so-called kinesine motor protein. It's a protein that is used to transport substances in the cell. And if you look how it works, it, it's really like a walking robot from a science fiction movie that is walking along these uh, filaments in the cell, the so-called microtubuli. So all these structures can be shown to be not only complex, but complex in a way that they couldn't have been built by a stepwise process. So that is another argument against Darwinism.
Then there's an argument from information theory, which was uh, championed by an American mathematician called William Damsky, who also started the intelligent design movement. And that's the argument from specified complex information. So information is a little bit fuzzy term. Uh, what we mean, of course, with information in the everyday sense is if a string of signs, which is independent from the message that it conveys, is conforming to an independent pattern and is conveying some, some other message. And that is, of course, the case in DNA, where you have this code, which is chemically totally independent from the protein, but is translated into, into proteins. And what Dembski has shown is that if you look what amount of information can be created by chance, and if you look at the probabilistic resources of the universe that are available in our universe, if, let's say, all particles would be combined in all possible combinations, then maximally 500 bit can be produced by, by random processes. And of course, in DNA, you find a lot of more information. And even by common sense, we know that computer programs don't program themselves or that books don't write themselves. And if you change randomly uh, some bits of information in a computer program, you do not uh, get from Microsoft Windows to Mac OS X, but you just ruin your program after uh, some small changes, uh, you will have a, a syntax error and, and the program will be ruined. And uh, the, the amount that, uh, of, 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 of obstacle that would have to be solved by the Darwinian pro uh, process, you can imagine, a working organism, the DNA for, for this organism, is like a book. And this book tells a meaningful story, a kind of novel, for example. Let's say Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And the meaningful story is the working organism. Now you want to transform this organism, let's say an ancient bipedal uh, predatory dinosaur, into a bird, into a totally different organism. That would be like a different book, which also tells a meaningful story. So you want to transform Shakespeare's Robio and Juliet into Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, but every and, and you just do it by changing random letters and selecting those books that uh, tell a meaningful story. Could you go from Romeo and Juliet to Lord of the Rings by changing random letters and always have a meaningful uh, book where there are no gibberish sentences? That's completely ludicrous. It's impossible. So this information argument was also made by a famous Austrian scientist called Henry Quassler, who is basically the pioneer of information theory and biology. And he emphasized information habitually arises from conscious activity. So we know that information, meaningful information in a significant amount, cannot be uh, created by random processes, but only by, by a conscious mind. And finally, the, the, uh, before I start with the actual paleontology, there is an argument from causal circularity. And that means in biology, you have a lot of processes which, uh, 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 in a way, uh, uh, are impossible to create by a stepwise process because the process that creates a certain product already needs the product in the first place. So, for example, you have these four nuclei bases, uh, uh, which are the letters in the DNA, A, C, T, and G. And the letter A stands for adenine. So, to make adenine, you need four, four substances, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, NAD, THF, and coenzyme A, CoA. To have ATP, one ATP, you need already six ATP. To make NAD, you require NAD and ATP. To make THF, you require ATP, NAD, and THF, and for CoA, you require all four. So that's, in a way, to, to imagine that this could originate naturally is like this uh, famous German uh, 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 story of, of Baron uh, uh, Münchhausen, who was pulling himself out of the mud uh, at his own hair, uh, which, of course, is impossible. And likewise, this process of causal circularity is an, an unsolved problem for the, the origin of, of life and these kind of metabolic processes. So now let's come to my own field, uh, the fossil record. So in the fossil record, we observe a lot of so-called discontinuities. 
So there are gaps and breaks and sudden appearances. You have abrupt origins, so-called explosions, where new groups and no body plans appear suddenly without precursors. Uh, you have a kind of top-down pattern. I will explain later what this means. You have so-called ghost lineages. You have stasis and living fossils and no evidence for gradual species to species transitions. And all these discontinuities are a problem. So why are they a problem? Uh, when Charles Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species, he uh, emphasized a certain Latin sentence six times in his book. And this Latin sentence was natura non facet saltus. Nature does not make jumps. And he emphasized this against the advice of his friend uh, Huxley, because Darwin knew if he wanted to have a naturalistic explanation and he knew major jump saltation would require kind of miracles. They would not be naturalistic explanation, only a stepwise process with tiny steps that could be explained by random events would uh, uh, fulfill his criteria. And this is still true. Richard Dawkins wrote 2009 and in his book, The Greatest Show on Earth. Evolution not only is a gradual process as a matter of fact, it has to be gradual if it is to do any explanatory work. And that means if the fossil record shows that evolution is not a gradual process, then this is not a minor problem for the evolutionary process, but it, is, it shows that it's not apt to really explain the, the evidence. And of course, already Darwin knew that the fossil record is not continuous and is, is, is not fulfilling his prediction. And he said that is one of the best arguments that could be named in, against his theory. But he said, well, it's probably just an artifact of undersampling. We, the fossil record is so incomplete. We don't know enough. And uh, with more knowledge of the fossil record, this problem will disappear. And even in the 20th century, there was a uh, famous uh, vertebrate paleontologist, Philip Gingrich, who works on fossil whales. whales. He uh, once said in a talk, gaps of evidence are gaps of evidence and not evidence of gaps. Sounds nice, sounds funny, but is it really true? And actually, it's not true, and you can even statistically show why it's not true. And, and uh, before I show this proof, I want to show an analogy which makes it easier to understand how you can show that this is not the case and that these gaps are really data to be explained. And my colleague Paul Nelson uh, uh, made this analogy. Imagine you have a new hobby, and the hobby is beach combing. You start to walk along the beach, and you collect what the flood washes in. So you collect mussels and shells and starfish and so on. And in the beginning, every day you collect, you find something new and you're surprised by new mussels and new snails and new starfish and so on. But after a while, repetition sets in and you find the same stuff again. And after a longer while, you find always the same stuff over and over again, maybe after some years. You find a stranded whale or a message in a bottle, but otherwise uh, it's always the same stuff. And then you have reached a point where you know that you have sampled sufficiently that you know what is out there and that what is missing is not missing because you were too lazy to collect enough, but because it's not there. And exactly the same approach is used in paleontology uh, to test the completeness or incompleteness of the fossil record. And in paleontology, it's called the collector's curve. So in this diagram, the collector's curve, you have two axes. The horizontal axis is the effort you have to invest to collect new fossils. So you can measure this in many years, how long you have to dig, or in, in uh, uh, funding and grant money you need to, to have a new project to find something. And in the vertical axis, you have the number of new interesting fossil species that you find. And you see in the beginning, this curve is steep. You just have to dig a little bit here, dig a little bit there, and you always find a lot of new interesting stuff. But uh, sooner or later, this curve starts to flatten and then repetition sets in. And that is the point where you know you have sampled sufficiently to know that you have found what is out there and what is lacking is lacking because it's not there. And uh, the gaps that are then still present are data to be explained. And this approach has been used in most groups of fossil organisms. And, and what you find in most groups is 
uh, that the completeness is very high in, in different groups, there are very rare exceptions. And there's a famous paper by Foote and Sipkowski, uh, published in Nature in uh, 1999, uh, which uh, looked at this in various group of marine uh, invertebrates, but the same argument can be made for plants or for, for plants. And before I show some examples, uh, uh, there is uh, one thing that has to be explained. I will talk about certain groups appearing suddenly within five or ten now many people will think, well, five or ten million years, that sounds like a lot of time compared to the short period of some uh, maybe 4,000 years of, of human history. But if we look at biology, let's say five to ten million years, and you look at textbooks, general textbooks of biology and paleontology, that is just the lifespan of one or two successive species. So there is an estimate of the longevity of an animal species from its origin over its lifespan till its extinction. And uh, this uh, is generally between two and a half to 10 million years, depending on the group. So if a group appears, a totally new body plant appears within five million years, that means just within the lifespan of a single species. So that is very abrupt. So let's look uh, at the very beginning at the beginning of life, at the beginning of Earth history, we had an event that is called the late heavy bombardment that happened about 4.1 till 3.8 million years ago. And there were a lot of heavy meteor asteroid and meteorite impacts. Some of the meteorites 10 times larger than the meteorite that made the large dinosaurs extinct. And uh, there's a paper, 2014, in Nature that showed that existing oceans would have repeatedly boiled away into steam atmospheres as a result of large collisions as late as about 4 billion years ago. So before this event, life couldn't originate because the oceans were several times evaporated. This event ended 3.8 billion years ago. So Darwinism would predict that you have to wait now a long time of chemical evolution before you have life. But life, boom, is there 3.8 billion years ago. We have the oldest really good fossil evidence for the origin of life. All older ones are, are highly controversial. The oldest certain record of microfossils of bacteria are from, from Canada, from Quebec, and about uh, 3.77 billion years old. So life pops into being at the very first mo moment in Earth history where it is possible, not after a long period of chemical evolution. And not only life as such, but already life with photosynthesis. So our oldest evidence now for photosynthesis for, for cyanobacteria is also 3.8 billion years. And this photosynthesis is one of the most complex metabolic processes in, in life you, you see up there. Uh, one model of one of the involved proteins and, and there are several of such proteins involved in this process that have to evolve. Darwinism would predict that you needed a billion year of, of uh, evolution to get this but it's there at the very first moment where life could originate. And also in this very early age a quarter of the existing gene families originated in a rapid evolutionary innovation that has been called the Archean genetic expansion. But let's look at some of the first macrofossils, fossils that even the average layman would recognize as fossil organisms. And these appear in an event that not for nothing has been called by paleontologists an explosion. It's the so-called Avalon explosion. Avalon is the name for an ancient continent. And uh, in this Avalon explosion, we find the first larger fossils of strange sessile marine organisms. Nobody knows what they are. We don't know if they were fungi, plants, giant protists or animals. Uh, it has been called the Garden of Ediaka because there is hardly evidence for predation. The organisms look very alien. They have a strange symmetry, a so-called glide symmetry. They are not left-right symmetrical, but somewhat shifted uh, the left and right side. They have a fractal growth, very strange, a kilted structure like an air mattress, no visible inner organs. And they appear out of nothing within a 10 million year window of time in the, the Idiakaran era. And there are no fossil precursors in the layers beneath. So 
first you have just bacteria and proteins, and then boom, you have these structures without intermediate forms that would show how they evolved. And the next event is the most famous of these abrupt events in the Earth history. It's the so-called Cambrian explosion, which has been called uh, in, in an article by Time magazine, Evolution's Big Bang. And what happened in this uh, time, and it's a window of time about 535 to 550 million years, but the main pulse of this event is just a 5 million year window of time. There we find all these animal body plants, the animal phyla, that is groups like vertebrates, mollusks, arthropods, and of the 28 different body plants uh, of, of animals, uh, we have 21 already in the Cambrian explosion. They appear suddenly and they appear without precursors in the previous layers. Uh, we know for certain that the, the Ediacaran fossils have nothing to do with the, the Cambrian fauna. And, uh, but of course, paleontologists were puzzled by this and they tried to explain this away uh, with the so-called artifact hypothesis. They said, well, maybe there were no suitable geological layers in the, the Ediacaran strata that could preserve the soft-bodied ancestors of the Cambrian animal phyla. That was a valid argument until a few years ago, and then we discovered uh, layers in Mongolia and in China, which are uh, geologically of exactly the same type as the most famous layers that have documented the Cambrian explosion, that were layers, for example, like the Burgess Trail in Canada. And in these layers, which would have had the possibility to preserve any kind of soft body animals, we only find algae. And even the, the specialists, uh, the, the evolutionist specialists on these localities agree that there were no animals at this time. So we have no animal precursors. So another argument to explain the Cambrian explosion away uh, was the so-called argument from the small shelly fauna. And in the lower Cambrian, you find these small shelly fossils, which are more or less just fragments of exoskeletons of the Cambrian animals. So fragments of arthropod skeletons, of, of sea urchins, of, of echinoderms, of mollusks, and so on. And then there is something in the Ediacaran that has also been called the Shelly fauna. And then the argument is, well, maybe the Ediacaran Shelly fauna is the precursor of the Cambrian Shelly fauna, and then we have some continuity. But when we look at the Ediacaran Shelly fauna, it's basically made only by two organisms, Pludina and Namakalatus. And we now know that they cannot be the ancestors of the uh, Cambrian animal phyla. Why do we know that? Because we have sufficient fossil record now to have growth patterns of these organisms, especially of Ludina. And they have a branching growth. And bilaterian animals, they don't branch. Only, let's say, cylindrates like corals all have this branching growth. So these were clearly not bilaterian animals that could be related to the Cambrian animal phyla. So there is no continuity in the small shelly fauna between the older strata and the Cambrian. And finally, there was a very good argument left uh, to explain the Cambrian explosion away, and that were trace fossils. Sometimes you not only find fossil organisms, but you find traces of these organisms, like they were walking on mud, or or they were digging in the mud, or you find fatal pellets or something. And this is called trace fossils. And we knew that there is a very large trace fossil record in the Cambrian, which is digging into the sea so uh, floor. Uh, therefore, the Cambrian is also called the Cambrian substrate revolution, because suddenly you find all these burrowing organisms in, in, the, sea, on, in the sea floor. But in the Ediacaran, there were also trace fossils of different types, but always only on the surface layer of the sediment. So the argument was, well, maybe these few surface trace fossils are the ancestors of the more complicated uh, trace producers in the Cambrian. And what you see in this photo on the left is the trace fossils from the Ediacaran fossil record, which sounds like a worm crawling and others look like an arthropod was walking there with his leg. And then there came a study by Mariotti et al. in 2016, and they made an experiment, uh, experimental paleontology. They said, well, we know that in the Ediacaran time, there was a special 
condition in marine uh, ecosystems. All the seafloor was covered by bacterial mats, we know that. So they let uh, such material mats grow in an aquarium tank and then they stirred up these bacterial mats and look what happens when they settle. And what you see on the right side of this uh, uh, photo is artifacts that are produced by these bacterial mats when they are stirred up and settled and then they produce these merely artifactual folding structures, drinking structures and you can see that all these trace fossils could be reproduced as artifacts of bacterial mats. So there are no plausible trace fossils of animals from the Ediacaran. So this final argument for the Cambrian explosion evaporated. And uh, then there was recently, uh, last year, a paper about arthropod evolution which said, well, the Cambrian explosion indeed was a very gradual event. It took 40 million years. This made headlines around the world. And when I looked at the actual paper, what the actual paper shows is the complete opposite of these worldwide headlines. What they showed is that the oldest real representatives of, of arthropods uh, that could be ancestors of the modern arthropods are 518 million years old. Then they looked what are the oldest modern arthropods which have really exoskeleton compound eyes and they found they are 521 million years old. Oops, 3 million years older than their assumed ancestors. So they had, had to assume a so-called ghost lineage. So of course the ancestors have to be older than the descendants. If the fossil record is the opposite then you have to postulate a ghost lineage. But then they said maybe we can solve the problem by looking at trace fossils and they looked at trace fossils and found trace fossils that are 537 million years old. The problem is usually trace fossils you cannot say which kind of organisms really made this trace fossil. It's just some imprints in the mud. But the trace fossils that they found are of a type that every paleontologist, paleontology student can identify. It's the so-called Rosophygus trace. And it's a resting trace of trilobites. So they found indirect evidence of relatively modern arthropods with exoskeleton, articulated legs, compound eyes already 537 million years ago. And the authors acknowledged that these new findings of the sediment in the Ediacaran that I mentioned from Mongolia and China, that there were no animals because animals did not exist 550 million years ago. This means in these 13 million years from 550 million years to 537 million years. You had to go from, let's say, a worm-like postulated ancestor to a fully uh, assembled trilobite with exoskeleton, these very complex compound eyes with articulated legs within the lifespan of two marine invertebrate species. Totally impossible to imagine this kind of reconstruction in the lifespan of two successive species. That's ridiculous. So the paper actually made the Cambrian explosion worse, but it was celebrated by the press as showing that the Cambrian explosion is not a problem. That shows you have always not to look at the headlines, but really check the, the actual scientific papers. But the Cambrian explosion is by no means a singular event. I will very briefly skim to uh, some other events to show that this happens everywhere in Earth history in all groups. So in the next age, in the Ordovician, about 470 million years, you have a sudden increase of these body plants that originated in the Cambrian. Then they are suddenly increasing from 100 to more than 500 different families and this has been called uh, the great Ordovician biodiversification event or in the popular literature life's second big bang. So another abrupt event in very short time. And what this also shows if you look at this pattern, Darwinian theory would predict that these large difference of the different body plants, how you build a mollusk compared to how you build a vertebrate or uh, how you build an arthropod, very different type of, of construction, that first you have an ancestral species and then the species would differentiate into two daughter species and they would differentiate into two different genera and then different families, different orders, and only after a long time differences would have accumulated to make up these large phylum differences of different body plants. 
But what we actually find in the fossil record is not this bottom-up pattern, but a top-down pattern. We find suddenly, without precursors, these differences of the, the different body plants, and then only later in the Ordovician, the diversification of these body plants into different families. So the fossil record is the exactly opposite of the prediction by Darwinian theory. And this goes on if we look at the first land plants, there here is a quote by Bateman, uh, uh, 1998, uh, who said the Silurio Devonian primary radiation of land, bi land biotas, which means uh, 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 plant communities on land, is the terrestrial equivalent to the much debated Cambrian explosion of marine fauna. So at the origin of land plants, we ex found exactly the same pattern of sudden appearance as in, in uh, marine invertebrate animals. And if we look at the oldest known land plant at all from the Silurian, it's Baragranatia from India. It's already belonging to a group that is still living today, the, the group of club mosses. Then in the Devonian next era, we have an event that was called by a study colleague of mine, Devonian Nekton Revolution. And it means nothing else that the complete uh, composition of marine biota was overturned within 10 million years. If you look at this diagram, you have three different ways how marine organisms could live. They could live close to the ground, that is called demersal. They could be passively floating in the water column, that's called plankton. Or they can be active swimmers like fish or cephalopods. This is called nekton, that's a blue thing. You see here where the red arrow is, before this event, the vast majority of marine organisms were either planktonic or living close to the ground, this green and a brown area, this vertical axis is the proportion, the percentage of, of biodiversity having this lifestyle. And after this event, suddenly 80% of, of marine biodiversity was uh, active swimming. So very abrupt total change of the marine ecosystem. Again, a revolution, it was not called revolution by Darwin critics, but by evolutionists. And the next event, also here by, uh, by evolutionists, called the odontoid explosion, around the same time in the Devonian, you find this sudden origin of tooth-like structures in different groups of fish, of, of uh, shark-related fish, of lobefin fish and wayfin fish. Again, within a 10 million year window of time, this sudden appearance of these fish groups and uh, of the uh, uh, teeth-like structures. And on land, you find in vertebrates the Devonian terrestrial revolution. And there is even a temporal paradox. If we look at this, these different alleged ancestors of, of land-living vertebrates, we have now uh, things like Tiktaalik, which was celebrated as a success for Darwinism. And then we have these tracks uh, uh, found in Poland. Tiktaalik is still very fish-like with fins, certainly not be able to walk on land, but these tracks were from a land-living animal that walked on land. The problem is these tracks are not only older than Tiktaalik, 10 million years older than Tiktaalik, they are actually 10 million years older than any of the lobe finned fish that, that are uh, attributed to the stem lineage of, of land-living vertebrates. So te terrestrial Vertebrates appear suddenly about 395 million years ago, and their ancestors appear 10 million years later. And in insects, my own field of study, we find something similar in the Carboniferous, all the different groups of flying insects. And there you have these larger categories like locusts and cockroaches and mayflies and dragonflies. And then you have 4,000 species of dragonflies and, and 10,000 species of, of locusts or something and, and, and uh, some hundred thousand species of beetles. All these different larger groups, they appear at the border between the lower to the upper Carboniferous about 320 million years ago. And not only primitive insects, let's say, like mayflies and dragonflies or roaches, but even very sophisticated insects like, the, like wasps or beetles, which have these very strange metamorphoses where the lava is not gradually developing into the adult by every mold is getting more similar to the adult, but where you have this pupil resting stage where the whole organism is dissolved into a kind of soup, reorganized, and then first you have the caterpillar, then you have the resting stage, and then the butterfly or the beetle emerges from the pupa. It's, it's 
first, it's unbelievable how this could evolve in the first place, but that this is present already with the first flying insects is totally contrary to Darwinian expectations. So something like this should be expected 100 million years later. But then in the next age, in the Triassic, you have a, a kind of carpet bombing of this uh, kind of explosive, abrupt events. There's a famous anti-creationist, Peter Water, evolutionary biologist, who wrote a book about the Triassic. And he said these abrupt origins in the Triassic were as important for animal life on land as the Cambrian explosion was for marine animal life. Same pattern. Again, we have it with Triassic tetrapods. We have the oldest mammals the oldest uh, uh, lizards, the oldest crocodile relatives, the oldest turtle relatives, and the oldest dinosaurs, all appearing in, in a short window of time in the, the Triassic. We have an origin from zero to 15 different families of, of marine reptiles. All of them are now extinct within an 8 million year window of time. And among them, even forms like ichthyosaurs, where you needed a transition, let's say, from a monitor, lizard-like, land-living animal to this dolphin-like creature within a window of time of only 4 million years. Unbelievable. And you have the same in flying and gliding reptiles. There's only a 2 million year window of time where you find all these different approaches to solve flying and gliding and even the first active flyers with the pterosaurs appearing suddenly out of nowhere. We don't even know how their ancestors would have to have looked like if they had some. And in the, even in dinosaurs, when they appear in the uh, Triassic uh, and diversify in the Triassic, there was a paper in 2019 about the dinosaur diversification. And from the abstract of this paper, it said, it's amazing how clear cut the change from no dinosaurs to all dinosaurs was. The same with these marine reptiles, the mosasaurs, the same with flowering plants, which appear in the lower Cretaceous about 120 million years ago. This was known to Darwin already, and he called it the abominable mystery, the sudden appearance, because it was so, so much contradicting his gradualistic expectations. And Oskin, in 2015, said then about 125 million years ago, angiosperms, that's flowering plants, and their flowers sprang forth during the Cretaceous period as fully formed as Aphrodite, without precursors. In butterflies, the same pattern in the, the lower tertiary. They appear suddenly, no butterflies uh, and, and no larger night uh, butterflies in, in the Cretaceous era before. They, they are there, and they are already there with modern families. No transition of intermediate forms. The same pattern in birds in the early tertiary. Uh, uh, there are only four lineages of birds that are postulated to have made it through the, the impact that uh, uh, extinguished the dinosaurs. And then within a 10 million year window of time, you have all these different lineages of modern birds suddenly appearing, and it has been called, wait for it, the Big Bang of bird evolution. The same pattern in Mammals, we have uh, here the most modern molecular phylogenetic tree of the mammal groups. That is this blue tree pattern. The horizontal axis is the time. The dating of the branching events in time is based on the most modern molecular clock estimates. So you see all these uh, uh, animal uh, mammal orders, so groups like uh, Arceodactyls and whales and carnivores and primates. They should have originated here in the Cretaceous, but what you see in this yellow band, all these red dots, are the actual oldest fossil records. And you see they all fall around the same time in the early uh, tertiary. There appear the first record of these groups. Nothing where it should be expected according to the molecular clock data. And when they appear, they appear even in sophisticated groups like bats. If you compare here the fossil of the oldest known bat, with the skeleton of a modern bat. You see it's indistinguishable. They even had echolocation. That's, uh, uh, it's not an, an half bat or an intermediate bat. It's already there in its earliest representatives. And even in humans where you often think, well, we have all these new findings in the last years of, of ape man from, from Africa, of Australopithecines, that we have a gradual pattern of transition from ape-like forms to modern humans. But actually, that's not true. There is a break between Australopithecines, 
between these ape-like forms and the real genus Homo, especially in the postcranial skeleton and, and the adaptation to fast running. And there was a paper by one of the most famous paleoanthropologists who is working on fossil humans, John Hawkes in 2000, who emphasized uh, uh, that in so far as we can tell, the changes were sudden and not gradual. And uh, the comments in the press about the study were new studies suggest Big Bang theory of human evolution. And even if we look at our cultural evolution, here I made a chart where I plotted 50 different cultural traits from stone tool making to fishing hooks and uh, cooking and so on. And green are uh, uh, things that are mere tool use. Brown would be behaviors that are related to symbolic thinking. So carving, for example, making necklaces, jewelry, uh, cave paintings, ivory carvings, and so on. And uh, most of them fall in a narrow window of time in the Upper Paleolithic. And this has been called by anthropologists the Upper Paleolithic Human Revolution. And even new findings from Africa, from, from caves in South Africa, they have not overturned this picture. And uh, it's still true that, that we have this sudden appearance of, of evidence for symbolic behavior in the Upper Paleolithic Human Revolution. And evolution is speculated that it has to do with, with some kind of rewiring of the brain. So maybe maybe not but it's very striking that even in human cultural evolution we find this kind of big bang pattern so a totally other thing is that was the large transition the macro evolutionary transition but darwin of course also predicted the gradual species to species transition on the minor level from one ammonite species to the successive ammonite species and what about the fossil evidence for this kind of species to species transition? Actually, even most creationists wouldn't deny that something like this could occur and that maybe all Darwin finches on the Galapagos Island descended from one founder species. But even for this kind of transition, <clears throat> the, the fossil record is very meager and collapsed in the past years. There were actually only two or three textbook examples of fossil evidence for gradual species to species transition, so-called anagenetic gradual species transformations. One example was from, was from marine protists from so-called foraminiferans, which have these very beautiful skeletons, and from a genus called Globrotalia, and it is the species transition from Plesiotubita to the species Tumida. That is a textbook example you find in most paleontology textbooks till today. And then there was a paper, 2009, and uh, the scientists studied the evidence again, and the title of the paper, which was published in the prestigious journal PNAS, already gives it away, Evidence for Abrupt Spatiation in a Classic Case of Gradual Evolution. They found it's not true, it's not gradual evolution, it's abrupt speciation covered by, by misidentified fossils. So this example is gone. Nearly the only other example, apart from uh, example from human evolution, which was uh, the, the uh, recently disproved case of, of um, um, Australopithecus afarensis uh, and uh, its precursor, where it was uh, postulated that there is a gradual transition, but that was uh, uh, now disproved by the finding of a skull of this uh, ape man. In a way, but the other textbook example that still existed is uh, snails from the Steinheim Basin in Germany, from the tertiary, freshwater snails. And there in the 19th century, there was a famous paleontologist called Franz Hilgendorf, and he actually made the first phylogenetic tree made with fossils, where he arranged these fossil snails in a tree where he postulated that, you gradual, that they gradually transformed into each other. <coughs> But there was a very early critique of his work that said, well, how do we know that these are really different species in the first place and not just different forms? Like in some plants, we, they, they look very different if they grow in the lowlands or in the mountain, if they are the same species. Maybe it's just different forms of this shell case in the same habitat at the same time. Now, uh, this has been studied recently in a paper published in 2015 in the journal Ecology and Evolution. 
And this genus of freshwater snails still exists, and uh, the scientists studied these uh, snails in freshwater lakes and the Himalaya region, and what they found is exactly the confirmation of this old critique. All these different shell types were present in the same species in the same lake at the same type uh, at the same time. So there are not different species gradually transforming in each other. They are just different shell types of the same species that occur in the same lake. So this example is also gone. And there has been a meta study by Hunt 2010, who uh, made for the Darwin year celebration, 2010 was this famous year, where there was a double jubilee of, of Darwin's birthday and of the first publication of the original species. And there he published a re-evaluation of all the fossil evidence for species transformation in the fossil record, 150 years of paleontological research. And here is a very interesting quote from his abstract. <clears throat> The meandering and fluctuating trajectories captured in the fossil record are not inconsistent with the centrality of natural selection as an evolutionary mechanism, but they probably would not have been predicted without the benefit of an empirical fossil record. So, if you really read between the lines, what this says, well, of course we still believe in natural selection, but what we find that these trajectories of these fossils, they are not gradual from state A to state B, but they go back and forth, meandering and fluctuating. And it's not at all what is predicted by Darwin's theory. It would not have been predicted without the empirical fossil record, which is actually contradicting the prediction. We would never have expected to find this pattern. So that is what, what the fossil record says about species to species transition. <laughs> And as final point, I want to, to introduce a problem that I'm currently working on with colleagues. And that is the so-called waiting time problem. And usually there are two fields in, in the biological sciences where people think they support Darwinian evolution. One is the fossil record, because the fossil record shows deep time, the millions of years, and it shows intermediate forms like Archaeopteryx, intermediate between uh, dinosaurs and, and birds. So there you have macroevolution, and then you have population genetics. That would be the study, for example, of uh, the origin of, of drug resistance in germs in the Petri dish. That would show microevolution. And then you extrapolate a lot of microevolution over millions of years, and you get macroevolution. But actually, when you combine these two disciplines, and you look what happens when you look at both evidences together, you find a major problem for Darwinian evolution. And what you find is that the windows of time for certain transitions that are established by the fossil record are much too short, orders of magnitude too short, to allow, if you make calculations with population genetics, to explain the origin and spreading of the required genetic changes. I will go through this more quick because I think this is getting too long. So basically you can simulate uh, uh, this evolution of new traits, of new mutations. Uh, you, can, you can do the math. There is a complete methodological apparatus in population genetics with the standard formula of, of population genetics. And uh, you need only some, some numbers for this. You need the mutation rate, which is known experimentally from different groups. You need the effect, effective population size, which can be reasonably be estimated by comparing with modern organisms. Uh, you need the generation time. Bacteria produce very fast. Humans need maybe 20 years for a, a generation. And then you can calculate and can, can look how long does it take to get, for example, two coordinated mutations in a lineage. And this has been done uh, for humans by, by Michael Behe in a book called The Edge of Evolution in 2007. And what he did is he, he didn't uh, make a model, uh, he didn't make a, a uh, kind of simulation. He looked at empirical data and he looked at malaria. And in malaria, we know that every time a new drug is introduced, some years later, you get resistance. But there was one drug where it took very long, 20 years, to get drug resistance. And that was the drug resochine or chloroquine, the substance. And when we, uh, people looked at the genetic base of this drug resistance, it showed that in all other cases, a single point mutation was necessary to get this resistance. And this originated very quickly in this large population with, with fast generation times. 
But for the resistance against, against chloroquine, you needed a double mutation. Two mutations coming together, each mutation alone has no selective advantage. Only when they come together, they uh, have this resistance effect, and then it can be favored by natural selection. And what Behe then did is then he ex extrapolated and looked, well, malaria has a very large population size compared to a human population size of ancestral hominins, which maybe was just 10,000 individuals. And if we compare this very short generation time of malaria uh, with the long generation time of 20 years or something for humans, what would be the number for humans? And he arrived at a calculation of 10 to the power of 15 years, which is longer than the existence of the universe to get a single double mutation originating in the human lineage. And of course, Darwinists tried to disprove this. And there's a famous paper in the journal Genetics in 2008 by Durrett and Schmidt. And they said, well, that's complete nonsense. Bayes' argument can be dismantled. 10 to the power of 15 years is unrealistic. They did their own calculation and they arrived at a time of just 216 million years, which is fine, which is much less than 10 to the power of 15 years. But the problem is there are only 6 million years available according to the fossil record since the separation of the chimp and the human lineage. So to get a single double mutation in humans, you need 260 million years and only 6 million years are available, that's still a problem. And of course, if you look at a model, at a simulation, yeah, there are always simplifications that introduce errors. I would rather trust the empirical data of the case of malaria and this uh, uh, number than this uh, uh, simulated number. But still, in any case, it's much too long time than is available in the fossil record. So. Uh, the same we are currently doing with whales, because in whales there is a very good fossil record now that is claimed as a success story for Darwinism. We have all these intermediate forms between, uh, let's say, a pig-like ancestor like Pachycetus, who lived about 446 uh, uh, million years ago, and then dolphin-like, uh, fully marine whales like Dorudon. So how much time is available to get from this pig-like animal to this dolphin-like animal? Actually, the fossil record showed it's only about four to five million years. So that's the lifespan of a single larger vertebrate species. And you need a very uh, large reconstruction uh, that is necessary. So my colleague Richard von Sternberg did a calculation based on reasonable estimates of generation time and population size and arrived at a time of at least 10 times the available time necessary for a single point mutation. Uh, for, for a single coordinated mutation, but probably you needed hundreds of coordinated mutations to allow these major reconstructions that were necessary, not only transforming limbs into fins and, and to have a fluke uh, totally newly made with this ball vertebra for the up and down movement. The birth process has to be reversed, uh, not head first, so that the fetus drowns before it is born, but tail first. The memory glands have to be reconstructed for nursing underwater. The kidney tissue has to be adapted to salt water. The lungs in whales can collapse and expand when they are diving and they are, have a special protein that is protecting the lung surface that has to evolve a new protein, which we have seen is very difficult. And, but the most striking thing is that whales have a problem. Whales swim with their fluke and there are large muscle packages that drive this fluke. But for the streamlined body, they also have, other than other mammals, the testes, the male testes, not outside of the body, but inside of, in the body, exactly where these large muscle packages are. And these muscle packages create heat. And maybe some of you have read in the news, blue genes are bad for male fertility because heat is bad for sperm, or sperm viability. With this heat close to the testes, whales would have gone extinct very quickly because they would have gone infertile. So what they build is a countercurrent heat exchange system to cool the testers. And I can show it to you here in a small movie. Here's the whale. This brown thing is the large muscles for the tail fluke. And between these large muscles, you see the heart system pumping here. And between these large muscles are the testers. They would get totally overheated by these muscles, but they have developed this kind of refrigerating system which brings cold blood from the fins to the testes and transports the hot blood away. 
and this had to evolve within four million years within the lifespan of a single larger vertebrate species from not existing to having something sophisticated like this. So one of the most famous paleontologists who is a critic of intelligent design and of, of uh, creationism is Donald Prothero, who wrote a book, Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters. And he had a debate at Beverly Hills in 2009, uh, which uh, was also participating Richard Sternberg. And when Prothero was confronted with this argument, he, he first didn't even really understand the argument, but he also had no response to this argument. He was completely baffled. And the funny thing is, Prothero has written an article about this longevity of larger vertebrate species, especially Arthrodactyls, who are believed to be the ancestors of whales. And he came up with this number of that uh, larger vertebrate species like uh, Arthrodactyls and whales have a lifespan of 4 million years. So he confirmed this crucial point that this available window of time for this total transition from a pig to a dolphin in a way is just within the lifespan of a single species. So maybe some of you think this is all just nonsense that is told to you by some Darwin critics or even creationists, but actually even mainstream evolutionists are now aware of these problems. I was participating at a conference in 2016 at the Royal Society in London, a conference called New Trends in Evolutionary Biology, where all the major evolutionary biologists were present. And the keynote was given by a famous Austrian evolutionary biologist, Professor Gerd Müller. And he had here a slide, which I show you in magnification, where he introduced several explanatory deficits of the MS theory. MS stands for modern synthesis, which is a synonym for neo-Darwinism. Explanatory deficits mean what the theory cannot explain, what neo-Darwinism cannot explain. And he mentions phenotypic complexity, complex organs, phenotypic novelty, new structures, new body plans, and non-gradual forms of transition, all these discontinuities in the fossil record that I've shown you. This cannot be explained by Darwinian theory. Hello, if this cannot be explained by Darwinian theory, then this theory is basically useless and only explains the origin of drug resistance in, in germs in the Petri dish. And maybe Darwin finches on the Galapagos Islands, but not more. And on a conference in 2018, neo-Darwinism was basically declared dead. It was a, not a creationist conference, it was a conference organized by the New York Academy of Science in Austria on genetic novelty, genomic variation by RNA networks and viruses. And the introduction to this conference on the website, you could read, could read the following remarkable admission. For more than half a century, it has been accepted that new genetic information is mostly derived from random error-based events, mutations. Now it is recognized that errors cannot explain genetic novelty and complexity. Boom, that's gone, game over. And even atheists agree. There is a book by a famous atheist philosopher, Thomas Nagel, who said he doesn't believe in God, he doesn't want to believe in God, he don't want to be the universe to be like this, but he still thinks that neo-Darwinism is nonsense, and he even titled his best-selling book, Mind in Cosmos, with a subtitle, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. So that is atheists saying according to the newest evidence. So some people say, well, those intelligent design proponents and Darwin critics, they only criticize Darwinism, but they don't make a positive argument for design. They only show why neo-Darwinism fails, but maybe we find something else, just give us 100 more years and we find another theory that can explain this. But that's not really true, because I would uh, claim that neo-Darwinism, this Darwinian process of natural selection, random uh, mutation, is the only possible explanation how complex structures could arise naturally by a mechanistic bottom-up process. In 2000 years of intellectual history of mankind, nobody ever came upon a different possibility. And there's a reason why atheist philosopher Daniel Dennett called it Darwin's dangerous idea and a universal acid. And Richard Dawkins said that only Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. It's not like there are a thousand other alternative theories around. And therefore, I think if neo-Darwinism as the only 
naturalistic game in town can be refuted, then this is equivalent with establishing intelligent design. It's not like the Sherlock Holmes fallacies. Uh, in some of Sherlock Holmes' uh, novels, Sherlock Holmes says, if you have excluded everything that is impossible, then whatever remains, even if it seems unlikely, has to be true. And this has sometimes been called, could be a fallacy uh, of the excluded middle. There could be other possibilities. But actually, it's not a fallacy if you have really excluded all alternatives. And therefore, I think this is a powerful argument, not only against neo-Darwinism, but also for design. So if we look at all the evidence that I have shown, I think uh, it is clear that the predictions of the theory, neo-Darwinism predicts gradualism, it's contradicted by the empirical evidence. Yeah. This conflicting evidence can not longer be explained away, uh, away as artifact of an incomplete fossil record. And so the total evidence is better explained by pulses of, of new information that were introduced into the system from outside, from top down, let's say downloaded from the cloud. And uh, that is certainly the, the more plausible explanation than a purely mechanistic bottom-up process. So that was my presentation, and uh, now we can go to question and answers. Thank you.